you might want to try to do that. So there's a little article in here about that this Tuesday, the early voting, so you can beat the rush. So, um, but please, get on the boat. Uh, let's uh, get into our worship service this morning and be able to pray. Save us from our sins. We truly help. We have the privilege to come and worship.
first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And after this uh, next selection, you'll go to God in prayer. <coughs>
prayer to you. Remember that sacrifice. We pray that we would keep that in the forefront throughout every week, every day, so that we can seek those who are lost and need you, and that we can share others the great gospel of Jesus. Help us to serve others, Father, and to strive to be more like Christ every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As we, as we prepare our minds to gather on the Lord's table, we'll sing the old rugged cross. Oh, oh. 
can you say to an old gospel hymn that tells the story so eloquently, but also convicts us so purposefully? We see the, the emblem of a cross throughout our lives, whether it's on a church steeple or traveling the highways and byways, we see crosses. We see necklaces with the emblem of the cross, maybe even bracelets with the emblem of the cross, or even earrings. earrings. And some are beautiful. But yet, at the same time, what did that cross symbolize? Well, the song told it. It told it very well. Suffering, shame, pain, and death. And that's what our Savior went through. He knew that from the day he was born. Even before he came to this earth, he knew that. He knew that was going to be the required sacrifice to save all men from their sin and to atone for the sins of all mankind. But then he also told us when he walked this earth that we are to carry our cross daily. The emblem of suffering shame, and pain. Do I really want to do that? Well, the only way we can carry that cross is with him helping us. And we gather around this table every first day of the week to remember his suffering, shame, and pain, and resurrection for the sins of all mankind. But we also make a, if you will, recommitment as we remember, as we reflect on maybe the past week or as we look forward to the week that's to come, what we have planned, but how we can serve the Lord better. Just like in teaching, review is always good because it brings to memory some of the things that you may have put in the back of your mind. But Remembering sometimes is always good, especially when it, can, when it pertains to the things of the Lord, the things that he's taught us. And so we gather around this table to reflect, to look, to remember, and to recommit ourselves every first day of the week. That's great. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We know that we come every first day of the week to do this. And to some, it might seem to be meaningless or just a tradition. But we know that it's more than that was never meant to be just that, but to be a remembrance and to express our thanks to you, our Lord, our Christ, our Savior. We ask that you bless the bread as we reflect on your sacrifice, as we reflect on the strength that you had to go to that cross, to endure the suffering and shame and pain. And we pray this in your high and holy name. Amen.
on that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, has a wondrous attraction for me. You can only imagine what blood stains do to wood, especially the type of wood that they use for that old rugged cross. But we think about those blood stains within us that help purify us, that help make us holy, that justify us, that sanctify us, that cause our adoption, as we have been studying up there. And eventually will glorify us. That's why the Hebrews took stock into painting the doorposts, painting the lenses, so the angel of death would pass over them. And so we do the same with his blood, so that when our time comes, we are made holy. Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, again we come to you thanking you for this opportunity to remember, to reflect on the full meaning of your sacrifice and what your blood does for all mankind. Bless this cup. Bless its purpose. Bless us as we strive to live closer to you this upcoming week than what we have in the past. But most importantly, we ask your forgiveness and we pray for your grace and your mercy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Father, we acknowledge that you own everything, that everything is yours, and we're just stewards of it for a time while we walk with you. And we pray that if we've been good stewards, that you would continue to bless us. If we've been stewards that uh, maybe haven't been so good, we ask for strength and knowledge that we would do better. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your blessings. And we pray that as the monies and the funds that have been collected would be used for your glory and edification, that souls would be brought to you. And we pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise be the Lord. Faithful love. <coughs>
Again, good morning to you. We're continuing this morning on our study of really our beginnings. Uh, we looked at the the beginning of the world as God created it in the opening chapters of Genesis, and then shortly thereafter, the fall of mankind. And we're tracing this story uh, through the Bible, and ultimately we want to see where it's taking us. And no spoilers here, but it's going to take us to Jesus. And then ultimately, where are we going from there? But we're, we're taking our way through Scripture. We, we showcase the goodness of God's creation initially with this series. Everything that God made was good. Every relationship that God had created, everything that existed was good. And then we showed that horrible cataclysmic event that occurred in the garden where all of human history has forever been changed in this world. Where sin entered into the world and death by sin entered into the world. Sin, sin came into the picture because of our first parents, Adam and Eve, they chose to distrust God and sin against Him in the process. And from there we saw how sin then went on to drive a wedge between every good thing and every relationship that God had brought into existence. Sin began to separate the husband from his wife and the wife from her husband. And by extension, it doesn't take long to get into Scripture, you see how sin drives a wedge between siblings. See Cain and Abel. You see how sin drives wedges between children and parents, and we just see the effects of sin spreading out all over, all over creation from very, very early on. We see a wedge driven between mankind and creation itself. The land would become troublesome and hard to work with, and well, here we are. We have to deal with that now. And even drove a wedge between mankind and their God. And you see people all over the place who even reject the notion that there is a God. Sin has done horrible, horrible things <coughs> to humanity and to the world that we live in. And while much of what we looked at last week, we could objectively say is bad news. A lot of bad things happened. We also introduced what we'll call the first glimpse that we see in Scripture of the good news of God redeeming mankind from their sin. The good news of the gospel. What God has done for mankind that we couldn't do for ourselves to bring salvation into this fallen world. We looked at Genesis 3.15 and it makes mention of the offspring of Satan being crushed by the offspring of Eve. Just a little glimpse and most people just gloss over it but it's, it's vitally important we see this glimpse of the gospel of the offspring of Eve crushing the head of Satan. But that's not all. The other glimpse of the gospel we see is that God provided Adam and Eve what they needed to be able to stand before him once again unashamed in spite of their sin. Remember, they tried to fix it themselves. They sewed the little one cloth of fig leaves together. That, that wasn't going to cut it. God provided what they needed that they could stand before him without guilt and shame. And that happened through the death of an animal. He, he put animal skins together to properly cover them, alluding to the sacrifice of Jesus. His death would create the covering we need to be able to stand before God as well. And so we're taking these little glimpses of the gospel through Scripture, and that brings us to today. We fast forward a few chapters. We missed some pretty uh, interesting events, the events of Cain and Abel, uh, the events of the flood, big Big things went on, but we just can't do them all. We can't do them all. So, today we fast forward to another key turning point in God's redemptive story. And we're looking at, we're going to just say Abraham for simplicity's sake. There was a name change that took place in this story. I'm going to mess it up, so we're just going to call him Abraham. We're looking at Abraham today, who was often referred to as the father of the faith father of the faith. We'll see how God draws him away from one way of life to a new way of life. We'll see how this new life is characterized by trust and faith, very unlike what we witnessed from Adam and Eve in the garden. We'll see how God views Abraham because of his faith and draw some conclusions from there. We're going to kind of try and keep it simple today. 
You're probably familiar with the story, and that's good, but it's good to be reminded. But the first things we need to highlight about, highlight about this new life is kind of how it functions. There is a way of life that Abraham possesses that's worth noting here. And the first thing is that in Abraham's life, he sees God makes him promises. He says to Abraham, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Abraham then trusts in what God has said and then lives accordingly. It's a very simple process, and it's, it's a picture we see in Abraham's life of how we ought to live. God says something is true. I either believe it or I don't, and hoping I believe it, I live accordingly. We want to have the same kind of faith as Abraham. And so let's look at this. God promises things to Abraham, and because of God's promises and his faithfulness, Abraham pursues God and what he has in store for. Look back at our text once more. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you are a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. There are a lot of things to look at here. God has made some pretty big claims, pretty big promises to Abraham. What's Abraham going to do in response? Well, there's three key areas where God promises to act in his life. It looks like this. He promises to take Abraham to a new place. I'm going to take you from a situation you find yourself in right now to one that I promised you, that I put together for you. He promises to take him and make from him a new people, a peculiar people. He promises then to give Abraham's life a new purpose. That's what we want to look into here. We're going to dig into these things. We see once again, just by way of reminder, a very stark contrast between two ways of operating in light of what God has said. God said, do not eat of this tree. What, does Adam and Eve, what do Adam and Eve do? Well, that's exactly what they go do. They distrust God and disobey. God says to Abraham, go, and I will do this. And Abraham actually goes and trusts God and obeys. We know from his story that he had some major issues along the way in his obedience. But he still continued moving forward, trusting that God would fulfill all of his promises, even if he couldn't see how he was going to do it. Very stark difference. And the first promise we see in regard to the, is in regard to the place God wanted to take Abraham to. He says to Abraham, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, it's important we stop and really think about what God is asking him to do here. This is a huge life adjustment, a huge life change. Moving is often a very stressful event. If you've had to move any time recently, you knew it was stressful. I hate moving. I've said that before. I, I don't intend to move. I don't have to. We look at Abram's situation here. This isn't just a move across town. This isn't like, hey, I'm going to move to over the other side of Dover. But this is, this is an undertaking. This is more like moving across country. This is a move in which it's very unlikely you'll ever see your hometown. You'll never see your old friends again. Or your family. God is asking Abram, give up everything that you know, that you're comfortable with, that you're familiar with. Leave it all behind to never see it again and go somewhere else where you have no idea where I'm taking you. Does that put a little bit more emphasis on the kind of faith Abraham had? Some estimate that this journey was somewhere around 1,200 miles. You would have been taking that on camel, I guess, whatever they would have taken. It's a long journey. It's unlikely he would ever return, and God calls Abraham to leave his whole life behind and start a new one in a new place, somewhere he's presumably never been to before, that's likely occupied by other people that he knows nothing about. But God also promises him 
that this place is where great things will come to pass for you. So that brings us to the second promise. The second promise is that of making him, of him, a great nation. God promises to Abraham that he, is, he himself would become great. Great in number, in power, all of these things. He, he would be a king of sorts. Think about that. God, you're going to take me someplace I've never been before, and I'm going to be a ruler. I'm going to be great and have power and authority. You sure? Okay. Through Abraham, God was establishing a new kingdom, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Does that sound familiar? It's language of I believe it's First Peter. Through Abraham, God was establishing his rule and establishing a focal point through which it would be a blessing to all of the families of the earth. That leads us to the third promise. The third promise has to do with that last part. God promises to Abraham that he would have a vital purpose in the world. His life would have more than significant meaning. It, it, would, it would really be kind of the ultimate meaning. Because through him, all of the nations of the world would be blessed. I will bless you, and in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, if you put yourself in Abraham's shoes, or even if you're just trying to think about it, you might be asking, how can this one man, Abraham, possibly be a blessing to all of the families on the earth? Do you think that question ran into his mind? God told him this. How can this one guy possibly be a blessing for everyone on earth? How could his influence be so expansive, so large, that it affects every living soul? I bet at this point Abraham was wondering that very same thing. Think of the, the inner, inner monologue he may have had. So you want me to leave everything I've always known behind? To go to a place I know nothing about? To somehow create a nation so expansive and so influential that it blesses the whole world? Huh? You sure? Me? 75 years old? It's remarkable. Remember, Abraham had no children. And it's really hard to start an entire nation if you had no kids. And especially so if you're 75 years old. At this point, he and Sarah, you know, they're, they're pretty up there in years. There were some biological setbacks on Sarah's side, for sure. And nevertheless, Abraham believed God and obeyed God. He says, God, I don't know how you're going to pull this off. It makes no sense. Frankly, it's impossible. But I trust you. This is where we pick up on the second half of our scripture reading for today. But before we move on, make one more note of this contrast between Abraham pursuing God in faith and our first parents <coughs> rejecting God in unbelief. We see here the tremendous faith and trust of Abraham in action. We see it in his obedience. We don't see that playing out in the garden so much. But anyway, back to our text. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. We fast forward a little bit. They've gone on some of this journey. They're getting to where they need to be. And Abraham settling in. He says, I still don't know how this is going to pan out. And you see the conversation here. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in vision. Fear not, Abram, for I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And you see where he starts to doubt here. Abraham said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, implying that they were trying. I continue childless, and I got this guy Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham said, to me, You've given me no offspring, and a member of my own household will be my heir. Maybe this is what God meant. I'm going to use Eliezer. He's going to be the guy. Maybe that's what he had in mind. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him This man shall not be your heir. It's not him. Your very own son, your very own, from you, Abraham, will be your heir. And he brought him outside. Abraham looked up. Check this out. 
Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you even can. He said to, said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and was counted to him as righteousness. When we move through this story, the first things that we encounter, encounter are doubt. Am I sure this is what God meant? And then God reassuring Abraham. He has to give him some reassurance because apparently Abraham was concerned that God wasn't going to come through. Abraham's concerns on a human level were very reasonable and logical given the circumstances. He's, he's an old guy. It makes sense why he would be concerned. Imagine what's going through his mind. What kind of ways he was trying to work out this problem in his own head. All right, well, God hasn't given me any children, though I've tried. He said, he said I would be a, a great nation. I'm trying. Nothing's happening. How is this supposed to work out? Maybe it's only I mean, he's, he's kind of lined up with this. Maybe it's going to be through him. Maybe that's how it's going to work. I can really feel for him. The way forward makes no sense. It seems impossible. But frankly, it is impossible. Can't see any way that this works out. And God is supposed to somehow come through and do all of these things. I bet most of us here can relate to this in some capacity. We're up against a situation, perhaps, where we're powerless to make progress. We cannot fix it. Something has gone across our path. We cannot fix it. We can't see a way out of it. We can't be in control of it. We're powerless to make progress, but then somehow, some way, God comes through in a way that we could have never cooked up for ourselves. He's, he does that. We also see here that God specifically tells Abraham that Abraham's way is not the way forward. The one option that he had come up with that he could conceive of taking place God said, no, that isn't it. All right, all the other options are off the table. And instead, God reiterates and expands on the promise that he had given him earlier before you taking this journey. Your very own son shall be your heir. One who comes from you will be your heir. And that really narrows down possibilities, doesn't it? Really narrows it down. And Abraham... Uh, would be involved in bringing this individual forth. We know from his story that once again he tries to force things to happen in his own way, uh, through his own power, through the situation with Hagar, which caused a whole bunch of problems because that wasn't God's way. That's not what he had in mind. God also says to Abraham, go outside. All right, let's take a walk. You ever had to go take a walk with a parent? Go have a big conversation. I had quite a few of those growing up. Let's go take a walk. All right, Abraham, check this out. Look up. Start counting. That's what the number of your offspring is going to look like. I know we have some light pollution out here, but if you've ever been in a place where there's really not, and it's a very clear night, you can get an idea of the scene to which God brings Abraham. You look up there and you're just overwhelmed with the amount of stars and light and beauty that you see up there. Once again, try to put yourself in his shoes as you're being told this information. Abraham, the old childless man, is going to have so many descendants he would never possibly be able to count them. And God was putting before Abraham in this moment another choice, one that we all must make. Believe me, trust me, or not. It's very simple. And out of this belief stems one of the greatest blessings someone could ever receive. Abraham received it. And when we follow in the footsteps of Abraham with like faith, we receive it as well. Abraham believed the Lord. He made the right choice. And was rewarded with what? What does our scripture say? He brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven, look to the number of the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, 
so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. This is the greatest gift you could receive. One of them. To be declared righteous before God. Look at this great exchange that takes place. Abraham, look at these stars. I promise you that the number of your descendants will be just like the number of the stars. Do you trust me in what I'm saying? Abraham trusted God. And God counted that trust as righteousness. How simple and how beautiful is that exchange? When we look at Paul's explanation of this very same account in Romans 4, I'd love to do that one of these times. He explains that it was this event that justified Abraham before God apart from anything that Abraham had accomplished or done. What's interesting about this is that God already knew every mistake that Abraham would make. He knew everything that was, came before. He never knew everything he was going to do later. And yet, here in the simple act of true, genuine faith, God counted that belief to Abraham's righteousness. Abraham standing before God as righteous would not be predicated on his performance, and we know that because Abraham had not lived a totally moral life, and he wouldn't act at this point either. Abraham's standing before God as righteous was not predicated on his law-keeping either, and we know that because the law had not been given him. Abraham was justified, counted righteous before God, because of the genuine nature of his faith. Not its perfect application, but its genuine nature. And so when we consider the story of both the fall and the call of Abraham, we come away with two huge conclusions about God's redemptive plan so far. That's what I want to highlight next from the lesson of yours. When it comes to our sin, we look at the garden. We notice that there's nothing that we can do to fix it, cover it up, or make it right. We cannot fix the problem that we brought upon ourselves. We must accept God's provision to cover over our shame, just as Adam and Eve accepted God's provision of the skin of that animal to cover over theirs. And God made that provision available through the death of Jesus Christ. When it comes to our salvation, there's nothing we can do to earn it, to merit it, or leverage it from God to give it to us. Abraham fully believed in God's promise and provision that he pursued God and what God had promised. And so likewise, we must have that same kind of faith. We must follow in the footsteps of our father Abraham, coming to God with nothing more but a living faith in him and what he has done to save us. How do we know we have that kind of faith? A living faith like Abraham? We see it. Just like how we see it in Abraham. We see it's real because it bears its fruit, the fruit of obedience. Abraham had a living faith. We could see him live it out. And so here's our two big takeaways today. I'll leave it, leave it with you. Will I trust God no matter what? I want to have a faith like Abraham, so you've got to ask these questions. Will I trust God no matter what? And what kind of faith do I have? When you consider your life, have there been times where you've been asked to do something that seemed impossible to do without divine intervention? We've probably experienced things like that. There's no way I'm getting through this. I don't see any way out of this. The only way this turns out good is if God has a hand in it. I think a lot of us have faced situations like that. Perhaps, perhaps nothing that drastic has happened to you. But what about the things that are more routine or mundane? Have you ever had to trust God through just the regular perhaps even uneventful days of your life, where it's like life is just uneventful and one day at a time. It takes faith to move forward in both of those cases. It might seem like things aren't going anywhere, nothing big is on the horizon, but you still keep trying to just trust God that he's there and that he's faithful even in the mundane. Regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in, big or small, Will you entrust yourself and your circumstances to God's care? That's the big question. If things feel hopeless and like there's no way forward, and you, if 
you perhaps cooked up some ideas on your own on how to handle it, will you choose to trust God first? <clears throat> when you consider your life, especially in regard to your faith, how would you characterize your faith? If you had to just put a couple of traits on it. My hope is that all of us would desire and pursue a faith like that of Abraham. A faith that isn't perfect in performance, but is, is real. It's genuine. One that trusts, entrusts itself to God's plan, no matter what that plan may be, and whether or not we see it or understand it. Mind you, you're not being asked to have a blind faith. faith. Biblical faith is not blind. It is based on evidence. A faith built on reason and evidence of what God has done is prior faithfulness. And when God asks you, do you trust me? What will your answer be? We hope to have that kind of faith. And perhaps you do have that kind of faith and you're ready to entrust yourself to God on a new level. Perhaps you're ready to make the commitment to obey his command to be baptized for the mission of your sins this morning and trusting him to be your Lord and your Savior. That pertains to you. We'll be happy to serve you in that way today. Perhaps you've already been immersed in water. You've, you've been baptized. But you found yourself once again immersed in the world and the worries of it. If you find yourself in that situation, then you don't have to be in that space alone. There are people here who love you, care about you, want to help you. We'd love to serve you today, no matter where you find yourself, and help you live out the faith that you possess and help you grow in. But whatever your needs might be, please don't let them go away. We'd love to serve you today. We invite you to come forward as we say this.
cut it before the show. We'll have one last song. We can do it. And uh, then we'll close out in prayer. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Love the